Hi, I'm Nick, Nick Maida, CEO of Gainsight, and I want to welcome you back to our Human First CEO series on LinkedIn Live. This is an amazing opportunity I get uh, you know, one or more times a week to talk to CEOs that I respect about how they try to balance all their stakeholders and truly be a human first leader. Uh, this week, I'm excited to have Bill Magnuson, CEO of Braze with me. Hi, Bill. How are you doing? Hey, how's it going? Pretty good. Thanks for having me. Good, good to see you. And thanks so much for joining. You know, Bill runs a great marketing technology company that's a late stage private company. And, and, up, and probably now in that phase where balancing stakeholders has never been more complicated than, you know, than now. And so really excited to kind of hear how you think about balancing all the needs of your stakeholders in the business. But before we jump into that, I always like to get to know the human side of each of the folks that are on this call. You're in New York City area right now, in, yep. in Manhattan itself, right? Yep, that's uh, right. Which unfortunately, like California is probably going downward in terms of more lockdowns and things like that right now. So you're, uh, you're probably missing some things in your life. What are you looking forward to post-vaccine, post-quarantine in terms of doing something that you used to do? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I think that um, when I think about that, though, the thing that I miss the most are actually the things that you can't plan for. Like we're, you know, because for safety reasons and for logistical reasons and what have you, um, everything that we're doing right now is so methodically planned out. Um, and the thing that I love about like traveling and exploring the world the most is just spontaneity, meeting new people. You know, we've got we've got a bit of a justified fear of the other right now, um, you know, as as you're as you know, we're obviously all encouraged to limit our social groups, kind of stay stay with immediate family or stay in close bubbles so that you don't have kind of mixing and spread um, happening. And uh, it just kind of removes a lot of the vibrancy of life. So I'm looking forward to uh, primarily just spontaneity getting back into the mix uh, versus uh, versus a lot of the planful uh, decisions we have to make when we travel and move through the world right now. That's a very thoughtful answer. I agree with you. I think that serendipity and spontaneity, you know, both in terms of our working lives and also uh, personal lives is is really gone away, and and I know what you mean yeah. about the fear of the other. Fear of the other. Every time I'm walking down the street, I feel like people kind of like try to stay away from away from each other and almost don't look at each other. It's it's a very uh, it's a very strange time in that way. Yeah, it kind of makes you realize that like fear of strangers probably derived from back in the day when you know we used to get taken out by the plague or what have you. Um, That's an been, interesting uh, point. Yeah, <laughs> it's interesting to kind of live through that. That's right. That's well, well, you know, hopefully we'll get to all that soon. Um, but, you know, in, in, in kind of between then and now we've got we got video streaming. So uh, to stay in touch with people. And I'm really excited to have Absolutely. this video conversation with you um, because I, I really respected how you run your company and talked to a lot of your current and former employees. And everyone speaks really highly of your culture. And I, w when we do these conversations, we think about these three different stakeholders we're trying to balance, you know, the community around us because um, businesses you know, exist inside a larger community our teammates and making sure they feel supported and safe and successful and then our customers. So let's talk about the community. This year, probably more than ever, companies have sort of woken up to the reality there's a community around us. We gotta, we're gotta, we not gonna be successful if the community is not successful. And your Braze yeah. isn't a giant company, you know, you, uh, similar size to Gainsight. So you probably don't have infinite resources to help the community. How do you think about what your role is in the community at the size you're at? Yeah, I mean, it, it's a great question because I really think that it's important that all um, kind of corporations, entities really think about their place in the community. How can they be good citizens in it? Um, and, and there's a lot of different ways to do that. You know, you're right. Obviously, resources are limited, um, but we all have kind of unique powers. And, and we want to make sure that we can amplify uh, the things that we believe in. Um, and so we looked at it from a few different perspectives. You know, there's there's a few communities we represent. Uh, you know, looking at what our what our employee base feels and what they as individuals and the messages and causes that they want to amplify. Um, so you know, right out of the gate, kind of as we descended into COVID and with a lot of the kind of Black Lives Matter uh, moments over the summer, um, we actually did some substantial amplification of all of our employee charitable donation matching um, and really wanted to do that so that people could. Make make their own voices heard louder. Um, you know, we obviously participated in um, a lot that happened through social media um, and, and a lot of the other kind of social channels that amplified our own messaging across our customer community and in our product. Um, we also, we actually had a, a lot of conversation around, you know, how do we take a lot of these topics that are happening um, in the US and really kind of front and center in the US and to communicate with a global community. Um, you know, yeah. we ultimately, uh, we made the call that, you know, when you look at things like systemic racism and injustice, that those those things are so pervasive across the entire globe that the message that we wanted to kind of project as a company was one that we, 
you know, we brought it to our entire global customer base. Um, we did uh, interestingly get some blowback from that from certain global customers. Um, you know, and I, I think a lot of the blowback, you know, personally, I felt was was inappropriate, and we addressed it. Um, you know, and and, and it, but it is interesting to always kind of look at that and realize that obviously um, your customer base, your employee base, the globe um, is not homogenous in how they view um, these types of issues. But e that notwithstanding, I think it's really important that businesses, you know, stand up for things that are really true to their values and they believe in. Um, so th there's a few other things I'd call out. You know, we also uh, we actually reappropriated all of our uh, Facebook advertising budget for the year uh, and mm. put that into direct donations into various charitable organizations. Um, we were actually in the um, kind of the earliest days of, of calling out on the boycott of Facebook funding. And, and we, you know, we, we took that and just reappropriated into direct donations into various causes. Um, we also launched over the summer in uh, collaboration with a number of our partners, a really awesome program called Tech for Black Founders. Um, what Tech mm. for Black Founders is, you can uh, go search for it online. Um, we've actually had over 100 applicants since we um, launched that. And we've already got um, a number of those applicants are live and up and running on the Brace platform. Um, but it's essentially pledges from um, a collection of our partners to provide free SaaS services to um, you know black founded or um, you know black owned businesses uh, and making sure that you know the it's it's a, a little bit that we can do um, in terms of looking at the systemic uh, kind of misrepresentation that exists across the venture capital universe and just making sure that, you know, if there's going to continue to be discrimination in funding, like what can we do to kind of help um, and providing free services and support um, to specifically the black entrepreneurial community, um, we felt was a place where we could uniquely move the needle, um, especially in collaboration with our partners. Um, and then we also, you know, we looked at things like we held our annual customer event in uh in october and that was something that we had a huge budget for to do in person uh and you know part of that budget gets made up for by ticket costs and obviously we right. were able to save a lot of money on operating expenses here by doing it virtually so what we decided to do was we actually donated all of the ticket uh revenue directly to the united way uh and wow. uh, because That's we awesome. didn't we didn't need it to balance the books anymore and so we just reappropriated that so you know we're really trying to look at like, how do we use our voice? How do we use our technology? How do we use our money um, and amplify the messages that we care about the most? That's incredible. I'm so I knew I was excited to have you on here because I knew you had a lot of different ideas and initiatives. And I think hopefully people are taking notes of things that they could do in their organization. A few things I'll pull on of what you said that really resonate with me as a leader. One is this idea of like global messages, because I do agree, like you and I both live in America. And I, you know, I think both of us have been in America our whole lives. And, you know, how do we connect? I have a lot of employees, actually the majority of employees in Gainsight are outside the US. And I think you have a big international team as well. Yep, and then absolutely. you have a lot of customers outside the US. And so how do we have our messages not sound so US centric, but at the same time, find themes that fit uh, globally? I think that's a really interesting challenge. I'm guessing you sometimes find yourself rewriting messages or emails to make them make them not just seem so US centric, right? Do you, do you struggle with the same thing? Yeah, I mean, I mean, it, it even comes to simple things like, you know, you're you're going to write a note, like I, I write a weekly email to the whole company. Um, and mm -hmm. a lot of times in the introduction, it's like, I hope everyone enjoyed, you know, Memorial Day weekend. And it's like, actually, yeah. that's not that's Same not here. the right thing to write. Right. And so just making sure that you're understanding the context uh, that, you know, that everyone has and and also realizing that now without the kind of in-person touch points, um, you know, time zones get in the way even more than they did before. You don't have the organic interaction as much. Um, and so I've been trying to go out of my way even more than normal uh, to get connections with far-flung places and making sure that I'm kind of trying to stay, uh, you know, living in their context as much as I can so I can understand it better. That's so, that's such a good point. Yeah. And even, even when you address things like weekends or obviously the election, things like that is a global context. The, the second thing I was going to pull on was this idea that you got some blowback from customers around some of the messages. And I think kudos to you, because if you're not getting any blowback, you're probably not really standing up for something. Right. So, and I, we've dealt with, you know, people internally or externally saying, hey, I don't agree with that. How, how do you navigate that as a team uh, generally? You know, when you when somebody says, you know, I don't like that Braze is taking a stand on X, uh, I don't agree with that, whether it's a teammate or a customer, what's that conversation look like? Yeah, I mean, you know, part of it is being consistent and knowing what you stand for and kind of holding to that. Um, and we try to derive that based off of, you know, our values as a starting point. Um, and so, you know, we definitely, I definitely kind of, believe that we shouldn't be weighing in on specifically political matters. Uh, but it's also the case that, you know, almost every cultural issue right now is being weaponized and becoming political matters. Right. And so exactly. if you just kind of broadly say, I'm not going to comment on anything that has been politicized, then you can't talk about anything anymore. Um, and so <laughs> exactly. I, I think it's really like not letting kind of the political zeitgeist uh, determine what you can and cannot 
talk about and stand for as a company, um, but still making sure that you're consistent uh, and that you, you know, communicate like why and how you think about these things. And so, you know, when we look at the issues that uh, that we stand for, you know, I, I broadly would describe them as like they're human rights issues. They're not political mm-hmm. issues. Um, and, you know, we we believe strongly in um, in support of those. And and, you know, we look at it from things like immigration, from worker protection, from, you know, a lot of the issues around systemic racism and representation. Um, and, and really, like, those are the things that we focus in on uh, as a company. And, you know, obviously, all of those things are politicized. Um, but we, we, you know, we try to stay consistent and hold ourselves to kind of focusing on the human rights aspect of it. I love that. That's very consistent with how we think about things. You got to you got to stand up for your values. The third thing I think that, that jumped out from what you talked about up front, is this idea that you partnered with other companies. I think this coalition around Tech for Black Founders, which is awesome and really inspiring. And I think that that is another way that a lot of companies are amplifying their own voice. Even if your company is only, you know, a thousand people or 500 people or 700, whatever each of our companies are, it, there's you know so much uh, potential if we all kind of come together. One of the things that happened in our community is we, we were able to get a lot of CS teams across different companies to agree to bring in underrepresented minority interns into their companies in customer success. And we kind of created a whole program around it. And now, you know, lots of people are going to get shots at getting into the profession that probably wouldn't have otherwise. So I think there's a big yeah. opportunity to, to link up. Yeah. Customer success is a great call out as part of this too, because, you know, we definitely um, braze, we only have uh, 950 customers, um, you yeah. know, and, and we primarily are targeted at the enterprise. And so for us, like outreach to various, um, you know, to nonprofit groups, to various fledgling organizations, to smaller startups. Like we, we, we definitely want to do those things, but we also, you know, we're an organization that's not built for that kind of low sophistication on ramp and and kind of, you know, a, a self-serve type uh, positioning. Uh, and so a big part of the success of these programs is really um, out of the goodwill of the customer success organization to to go and hold people's hand and really kind of bring them that's up the sophist- sophistication curb. Uh, and, and so that's not, and that's not something that's necessarily like, predicated in a lot of our like operating expense models, right? Like we yeah. assume that like a single customer success person will be able to kind of handle a, a specific book of business. You know, we're generally kind of applying a number of companies and also a dollar amount to that. Um, mm-hmm. And when we do outreach that, um, you know, goes out into the nonprofit world or, you know, in, into kind of other areas, um, it, it, it doesn't really fit the model of the typical business that we work with. Um, and so it is important that we're actually engaging with our customer success team as well, because they're really the ones that are going to carry the burden um, to bridge that gap. Uh, but, you know, it's also something that's it's, it's super fulfilling, right? You know, when you, when you look at uh, the, you know, a lot of the nonprofit groups that we work with, it's really amazing that we work with those groups, um, you know, even if they maybe are, are not resourced in the same way that some of our, our most sophisticated enterprise customers are, we still want them to be able to be just as successful. Um, and, you know, it, often we're kind of helping make up that gap and that's coming directly out of customer success. Incredible, Bill, really, really thoughtful. And we'll come back to that obviously at the end. So on, let's switch over from the community to the team. And, you know, you've, you and I have had, both had the benefit of helping to shape the cultures from the beginning, right? And I'm sure it's not just you, but lots of other people that have, have formed that. How did what what have the values been at Braze, and have they evolved at all as the kind of company's gone through its journey? Yeah, um, you know, very specifically, we actually went through a whole values refresh that we uh, launched at the beginning hmm. of the year. Um, we were oh, we were lucky uh. we were lucky enough to act from a timing perspective. We actually had our full company kickoff where we flew everyone in the company to New York in February, uh, yeah. like basically the, the last day. moment yeah. we possibly could have done it. Um, and so we were actually able to have uh, a big kind of in-person collaborative effort to really help, uh, you know, sharpen the early framework that we had as we relaunched them. Um, and we relaunched our values, uh, it, you know, over the course of Q1, we've been operationalizing them over the last couple of quarters. One of the reasons we did a refresh was that while we believed in the values, um, they weren't really articulated in a way that we were able to genuine, that we were able to like integrate them into various programs we weren't able to integrate them into performance management. They weren't useful to make decisions day to day, et cetera. Those were kind of the litmus test of like, are these things useful uh, that we wanted to use? Because if you can make them useful, then they're going to self perpetuate themselves. They're going to kind of, you yep. know, they're going to really ingrain themselves on their own. Uh, and so we worked on a rearticulation of the values that we represented. Uh, I'll highlight three of them uh, that, you know, I think are particularly notable. The first one is take your seat at the table. 
Uh, and this does a few things, you know, one, there's a table, it's a collaborative yeah. environment, but like we're speaking to you as an individual and we're directing a charge at you, which is to take initiative, you know, take your seat at the table and add to the community with your unique talents and perspective. Um, and I think that that concept of add also bleeds in here in a good way. Um, we mm -hmm. use culture add instead of culture fit. You know, That's we great. we described it as like, we want Braze to be different because you're a part of it. Like we want it to be a tapestry of amazing individuals, not just an assimilation machine of some kind. Um, and so, you know, we, we kick off the values with like, take your seat at the table, like get engaged, you know, get at the edge of your seat, join in. Um, the next one is don't ignore smoke. Uh, which is a value hmm. or like kind of a, a colloquialism that's been in the business since the very beginning, um, you know, grew out of engineering, which is just like, if you see something, say something, because it yep. might be a sign yep. of a bigger problem. Um, you know, it, and I think that this covers like, it covers urgency, it covers transparency and teamwork. Um, you know, it's explicitly don't ignore smoke. It's not don't ignore fire, right? It's like, right. If you see something, right. like, jump on it. Um, and it's also like, not only do we not shoot the messenger, but we actually celebrate the messenger. Mm -hmm. And so if you see something out of place, you know, the analogy I always use is like, if you're, you know, you're, you're outside and you see some smoke over the next hill, like you got to run up the hill to figure out like, is that your coworkers just like roasting marshmallows over a campfire? Or <laughs> is there like a house that's on fire over there? And until you go and look, you're not going to know. Um, and so we really encourage everyone like, don't ignore smoke, like investigate it. Worst case scenario, Worst case scenario, from a time efficiencies perspective, you know everything is fine, but you get to learn something new. Um, but in in so many scenarios, especially at a fast growing company, uh, you know you actually do notice a larger problem, and you can get it addressed before uh, you know it really has any sort of spreading repercussions. And That's then, so good. The yeah. No, no, go, go ahead. No, no, go for it. Finish your third one. I want to hear the third one. Yeah, I was to say that the third one is seek the truth. Uh, and this is a combination of like being an investigative journalist and also being a data scientist. Um, so like with seek the truth, what we say is like, we want to speak truth to power. Um, you know, we also, we do recognize that like we're a technology company and, and we also all just went through this with COVID where the whole world got turned upside down all at once. And so in a lot of cases, like in our quest to be data driven, um, in that, like be a data scientist part of it, uh, you know, there's a recognition that there's a lot of times when you don't have meaningful historical data, you do need to rely yeah. on your intuition and your experience. Um, but when you do that, like, even if you're going to go through a process where you're going to kind of, you know, try to try to read the tea leaves or, or, you know, predict or shape the future, um, that you want to do it in a way where you're setting yourself up to measure, you know, how are things mm -hmm. going um, and that you're really always driving toward more the ability to make decisions with data, um, because we think that that like lets you drive out bias. It lets you kind of stamp out, um, you know, incorrect kind of colloquial wisdom, et cetera, um, and really just ultimately make better decisions. And when you do make them, make them with more conviction and therefore faster because you've got data that you can rely on. So, um, you know, that those are uh, those are three that I would highlight. You know, I think that they're you can kind of see in them that they help you make decisions day to day of like, you know, what what should I do right now in this moment when I see something? Um, and that's been an important part of their success. I love that, Bill. That's so thoughtful. And I really, you know, you use that phrase, sharpen the values. And I think that's such a common thing that I see companies need. You know, you, their values are very ambiguous. Maybe maybe this is what you were trying to solve in some ways with your off your offsite and your the work you did in the beginning of the year. And th when you describe them, they're very sharp. And by the way, I will say if there's a motto for the customer success in industry, it's uh, don't ignore smoke. That's like a perfect <laughs> motto for customer Absolutely. success, right? It's like a very timely tied into sort of what a lot of people do. You know, going, I looked at your background and obviously you and I've hung out at events before. And you, I think you, you spent time at Bridgewater before uh, Braze, right? The, yep. Bridgewater, I think also has a very sharpened culture, which not everyone likes, you know, some people like it, some people don't. Were, th were there any lessons that came out of Bridgewater? Um, and for folks that know, Bridgewater is a very famous hedge fund that founded by Ray Dalio and it's uh, he's written books about it. Was there anything that came out of it that was relevant to your journey at Braze? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think that there's a lot of assumptions that Bridgewater can make about their employee makeup, their company history, you know, et cetera, um, that allow for them to kind of express their values in a in a way that doesn't really make sense for a fast growth technology startup. Um, but I think that a, a lot of the kind of things about me as a person that originally attracted me to the Bridgewater culture um, and the, the focus on like direct communication, on transparency, on, you know, ob objective and data driven decision making and such, um, you know, certain those are things that attracted me to Bridgewater in the first place. And I, I kind of refined my ideas around that, seeing them in action at Bridgewater. Um, and absolutely, that was a big part of, uh, of, you know, the thinking of how we were going to form the culture at, you know, Appoy in the early days, you know, becoming Braze today. So that's awesome. Did you ever try implementing any of the, the radical feedback stuff uh, that Bridgewater, where 
I think they give people feedback in meetings and all that. Did you do any of that at Brace? Uh, so we had we didn't like operationalize it with uh, iPads and dots and all that, and, and I, I don't want to I don't want to fully rabbit hole us on that. Um, but actually, interestingly, a lot of that stuff was after my time um, at Bridgewater. Oh, interesting. Um, oh. A lot of the things that you've written uh, read about, and so th that's kind of what I'm talking about as well, in the sense of like there's a lot about a lot of unique things about Bridgewater's environment that have to that. Uh, kind of drive the implementation of a lot of those values and like what yeah. you're alluding to, I think is an implementation of them. But I think that the the core spirit behind it of like directness, transparency, um, you know, that ability to like, you know, the, let the idea stand on its own, like let's rigorously debate, uh, you know, topics to make sure that we've got conviction behind our decision making. Let's rely on data um, and, and kind of systematically find places where bias might exist in decision making and, and remove them from our decision making processes. Um, you know, all of those things are really important when you're trying to uh, beat other smart people at anything. Uh, you know, at Bridgewater, they're trying to beat other smart people at, uh, you know, at, at investment uh, and you know, in in any kind of business, in any kind of fast growth startup, in a competitive environment, uh, you're you're trying to do the same thing conceptually. Yeah, I love it. That's great. I think the commonality of you know, a lot of great companies is sharpened values and culture, and you know, both both Bridgewater and Brace have that. So let's let's go to my third chapter of this discussion, which is my favorite, which is customer success. Obviously, you know, I'm I'm kind of into that a little bit. Um, and so you know, customer success, I know, has something been really important to Brace from the early days. And I'm curious now that you've run a SaaS company for a long time. You know, what's misunderstood about customer success? You know, what, what do you think most CEOs don't get about it? Or perhaps it takes them too long to understand it. Um, oh, man, I don't I don't know if I can answer that directly. Um, but, you know, I'll, I'll say that, like, in looking at it from the investor community lens and kind of how people value it uh, and, yep. and just thinking about, like, even even like think about how it gets reported in financial metrics. Right. Like in some world, it's a, a, and there's a lot of variability on this. So, like, in some world, it's like part of COGS um, and it's seen yep. as like a, a cost of delivering the service. In other worlds, it's part of sales. And mo mostly it's like split between the two because um, right. they kind of represent an opportunity to grow your existing customer base through kind of identifying and uncovering additional opportunities within the install base. Um, and then, you know, in, a, in another world, they are also helping play the role of technical support in some cases, um, mm -hmm. depending on how you kind of design the organization. Um, and so I think that really the, the fact that, uh, you know, a lot of their responsibility set lives between what you would traditionally call like an account manager um, and a technical support team. Um, but then once a layer on top of that, you know, we really describe uh, the kind of vision of customer success is to uh, of our department is to bridge the gap between the actual and the possible um, which yep. is like you know there's a lot that our technology is capable of um, we want to help our customers like promote their creativity promote their um, you know the kind of the spirit of experimentation and, and trying to really go and and strive toward more sophistication you know we've We've, act, we've designed Braze as a product to be kind of the platform you graduate to and one that you then mm -hmm. never graduate from. And so we right. are most successful. Our product is most sticky um, when our customers are really kind of pushing themselves to achieve more and more sophisticated goals. Uh, and our customer success team is just instrumental to that, right? So for us, it's not just like, do we get them up and running? It's actually like, do we get our customers into a position where they're utilizing us in a way where we can very easily differentiate ourselves from the rest of the market, where we can really easily deliver the ROI that we need um, to you know, make our case at renewal time, um, and where ultimately the customer is going to see the best results and, and be happiest. Um, and that's all done through kind of getting them to uh, higher levels of maturity, higher levels of, higher levels of sophistication. Uh, and that's been really important for us across a whole bunch of dimensions, uh, but, but especially because of the, the way that we've designed the product, the place that we kind of uh, position ourselves from a go to market perspective, uh, where we're really trying to kind of enable and push ahead uh, sophisticated goals in the customer engagement space. And our customer success team is a huge part of that. I love that closing the gap between the actual and the possible. I think that is so, so spot on for the long term vision once you get past, you know, support and retention and churn and things like that. So well, it's great. You know, one one question to tie this all together, you know, there's definitely a different schools of thought of what it means to be a leader and be a CEO. And there's certainly the more conventional wisdom of, hey, your job is singularly the bottom line and shareholder value. And some people would say that even any of this stuff that we've talked about today could be a distraction to that. And I'm curious, you probably thought about both sides of this too. How, how do you think about that? Kind of, you know, when if you were debating that person, what would you say? Uh well, if I was debating them, uh, I would probably be a little bit less flippant than what my initial reaction was going to be, which is that I think it's naive, myopic, and absurd. Um, I also think, like, I mean, the life of the CEO is to kind of, you know, 
make decisions across tons of dimensions and tons of areas and to pick something as important as this to our community and to like the kind of health of our societies and and like being a good citizen in the world and say like that thing is the distraction that I'm going to try and get rid of. <laughs> it's just like. I, I don't know that it, it seems ridiculous to me. Like, I think that, you know, no business can be successful without being in a, um, you know, being in a healthy community and a healthy society, um, you know, healthy cells in a, in a dying body still die at the end of the day. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, and, and so I, I think that we all have a responsibility to um, really, you know, participate and challenge ourselves to uh, improve our, the communities around us. Uh, and, it, and if people have decided that, you know, they're just not going to participate in that, you know, they're, they're, they're free riding on what I think should be a central, corporate responsibility and i think we should judge that negatively that's such a good good thought I, I the healthy cells is a great analogy to it and i agree with you i think obviously everyone has their choice of how to run their companies but the companies that don't think of themselves as the broader tapestry they are free riders they're taking yeah. advantage and, and i think that's a, that's a good point and you're right judgment does have it does have an impact so bill this has been amazing i knew this would be such a thoughtful conversation i it, it even beat my expectations so thank you for being here <laughs> thanks for thanks for um sharing so honestly and uh, you know, uh, good luck and stay safe going forward. And thanks to everyone for watching. Really appreciate you joining and look forward to seeing you next week. All right, happy to do a B race. So let's, uh, right. looking forward to next time. Okay, thanks so much. See ya. Cheers. Bye.